So, only open the messenger to ask. Everything is working. Now everyone should already hear us. Can you say something? Yeah. Um, uh, should I okay. keep my? So, do you want me? Do you want me to do the presentation? Like this presentation or world building, or do you want just to do a Q and A and we talk about different topics and whatever? Give me a second. I will only see if I can hear you on YouTube, and then we can start. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's working. Great. Uh, so, like, hello everyone. Uh, today we have a special guest, Diego Gisbert Lorenz. I hope I said it right. Because yeah, I have yeah, been goodness. writing it with an O after Gisberto for like past week. I couldn't <laughs> just remember there's no O. Uh, so yeah, I met Diego for the first time at Promised Land in 2018. It was quite a long time ago. And he gave back then a presentation on world building. That I found extremely cool, and I actually used the notes from this presentation in my master thesis. So thanks a lot, and I'm really happy to to like have you here. So at the beginning, could you just say something about you, like how you started and everything, and the presentation will just go in the background. Um, perfect. Should I start now? Uh, not the presentation. Just like, who are you? How have you started the art and, and everything? Like a short intro. Okay, so um, I come from a small town in Alcoy, in Spain, um, and I always been drawing. This is like that's the thing. I I started as I was a, uh, when I was a kid. I never stopped, and I was lucky to have a very good arts and crafts school in my hometown, which with a very good selection of teachers, and then I studied illustration. Then from there I moved on to Valencia to study university, and I studied fine arts. And while I was there, I was in my Erasmus in Czech Republic in Prague. And I met a guy from Finland who was a concept artist. I didn't know what concept art was. I didn't know it was a thing. And he actually saw my sketchbook and he, was, he told me like, hey, um, are you a concept artist? And I was like, what? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> so he dragged me to the closest computer and he showed me conceptart.org. And he f literally grabbed me and took me to a store and forced me to buy a Wacom tablet. And yeah, I discovered Photoshop. And I was like, oh, this is a thing. <laughs> I can actually work and make money out of this. Oh. Um, so I made my, old, my, my last project in university was about concept art, even though I didn't know it was called the way. Mm -hmm. And shortly after, like a year after or so, after applying to a million places, somehow I got a call from Madrid from a studio called Mercury Steam, which mm -hmm. still exists to this day. And a few weeks later, I moved to Madrid to start working on Castlevania Lodge of Shadow, which was my first project. Nice. It was a really cool project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> what the hell? I'm so lucky. And more or less, how old were you when you started? Uh, let me think. That was 2007. So I was 27. Ages ago. Nice. Well, yeah, it, yeah, it feels like it was yesterday, to be honest. I still oh, feel yeah. like it was yesterday. <laughs> nice. That's <laughs> also cool. <laughs> nice, nice. And now you are based in Berlin, right? Yeah, I moved here a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And somehow I stayed. Oh, nice. So now you are fluent in Spanish and German? Or you don't speak German? I speak very little German. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, I feel really <laughs> sorry about it at this point. Um, <laughs> But yeah, my German, my Spanish is fluent. Nice. <laughs> my English too, so uh, it's good enough, I guess. Yeah, I I wanted to like watch your videos, and I just opened like your YouTube channel. Also, there are links to all social medias of Diego in the description. So if anyone there, and I opened your video, and I was like, why I don't understand? Ah, oh, okay, this is Spanish, not English. <laughs> Uh, yep, <laughs> that's the thing. Like I started to like created this YouTube channel uh, ages ago, but I don't have really time to edit mm. the video so the few thing the few things that i uploaded they either don't have any voiceover or if they have is in english mm -hmm. and i was like why am i not doing them in spanish like <laughs> I, I can do both i'm actually i want to upload the same video with commentaries in english too soon when i when mm -hmm. i have the time nice. uh, okay i will go to your shared screen so we will have a presentation on the world building. So actually, this is a, almost exactly the same presentation as you gave on the Promised Land, or 
a lot um, of change. The base is the same. Really, I, I updated some things because I changed my mind about some stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but you will see. You will see. Like the, the thing, the main difference is compared to the one that you saw in Promised Land, uh, like it was like three years ago, I think, or is that. Um, free. Yeah. Free. Mm -hmm. That there would. The approach that I had in 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 Poland, like when in Promised Land, was more about the more obvious aspects of world building, like the formal concept are related aspects of how do you create things, how do you draw things, you know, creatures, buildings, this and that, whatever. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of concepts, but they were less based, less focused on script writing and storytelling, and more focused on the visuals of it. Um, and this is more leaning towards the storytelling part of it. Not so much to the character or concept of development, but there is a lot of it too. Okay, so I guess the, the stage is all yours. So if anyone will have any questions, like feel free to ask them. Uh, I don't know when to ask your questions. So if something will be like, I don't know, I'll raise a, I don't know you want. Okay, I will just tell questions. If... <laughs> yeah, sure. So, all right, everybody. I don't know who's listening, but I hope you are enjoying this. Um, please, if you have any questions, we have time. So please ask them. Um, this presentation is the one that I used recently in a festival, a uh, film festival in Rome that is called Heroes. It's a small but very nice festival that I recommend you check. Um, and if you, know, if you can attend, any excuse to go to Rome is good. It's a good one. <laughs> It's mm -hmm. as simple as that. So let's go with this. Um, so this is the thing. War building is kind of a weird concept, right? Uh, the first time I, I saw uh, a job, like a job offer for a war builder, I was like, <laughs> professional, like senior war builder? What is this? What are they asking mm -hmm. for? Um, of course, I applied because I have no idea and I applied anyway. Um, but yeah, mostly when you hear about war building or if you do any research in Google or YouTube about war building, you will find something like this, which is related to role playing games or writing. If you're writing a novel or something like this. Um, and it's more about um, really literally creating a world, describing it, finding out the cultures that live in that world and the climate and the magic system and everything that makes it special. And that's lovely, but that's not usually what we are told to do as artists or as, let's say, storytellers or filmmakers. Um, there is a spectrum of what you would call hard world building and soft world building. And I, I realized while I was developing this talk, that uh, this presentation, that uh, is, they are not two extremes of the same spectrum. They are actually like two lines that you can combine, and that should be actually together in the same, like in different proportions in your story. And I'm showing here three movies that are excellent in their own right, and that I consider examples of different proportions of this mix. So let me explain myself. I, I will continue talking about this now, but let's say Blade Runner, the original one, leans much, let's say proportionally speaking, is 85% hard, solid world building, and a healthy amount of abstract world building. Like, you know, leaving the story soft enough to leave you with some questions. And if you have watched the movie, if any of you has watched the movie, you will know what I'm talking about, especially by the end of it. There are some elements that really give the audience, leave the theater with questions like, what the, what is this? Was it this or that? Or, you know, and that's why people keep talking about this movie 30 years after it was released. Um, Children of Men. I consider it like also very much what I would call hard war building, but it's in a very subtle way. And now I explain why. And then the Green Knight, 
which is a more a much more recent movie and I also recommend it highly. It's an excellent movie. Is much much more soft in a good way. Let me explain why. So Harvest is soft. Um, roughly explained, you know, it's much more complicated than this, but basically hardware building tends to be focused on the actual factual elements of the world. Like the systems that govern this world, you know, if it's if there is a science fiction or magic or magical fantasy environment or something, which are the ways in which this magic works or uh, physics work in that world that make it special and they're very well defined and they're never broken and so on and so forth. Or uh, the politics of the world, the social system, whatever makes the world special and defines the tone of the story is very well defined. Is very clear and in somehow it makes sense. Um, as I said, you know, like there, like it, the whole world that you are creating there in this bubble that is the story that you are creating, it's all interconnected. All the pieces kind of flow together and everything supports each other according to this one main idea that you are giving your story. You know, your story might be about the struggle between two wildly different social classes. Or uh, as in Children of Men, the depressive atmosphere of a world where there are no more children, there is no new life. You know, and all this affects people there. And, you know, this, this set of rules, they feel very solid, they feel very consistent, and it's very hard to break them or to bend them in a way that doesn't affect the story. You know, usually what this, what, when this happens in poorly written movies or novels, uh, it's what they call the suspension of disbelief, like the, they break the suspension of disbelief. It makes, it pushes you out of the story. It makes you a question like, what? Why is this character doing this? Or how come that now spaceships can do that? Or, you know, it's like, what? Whereas, if it's if the rules are not broken but but bent, um, well, we will get to that point in a couple more slides. So I'm just gonna reserve this. Then okay. onwards to the software building. You know, soft is more or less like how you create the the ambient and atmosphere and spirit of of the story. You know, and it tends to be much more subtle. Like it, it's more when. Um, you can play, let's say, a lot more with the palette of colors and light that you're using, and even the shapes that you use in in the landscapes or the or, or even the framing of the story to provide a feeling to it. So it's like you are not setting up any formal element of how society works in that universe that you're creating, but you're giving the audience a feeling of, let's say, how oppressive it is, or how depressing it is, or how how whimsical and fantastical it is, because the saturation is always up and uh, the shapes are always soft, you know, kind of stuff. And it tends to be more poetic in a way. You know, things may still they might still make sense, but they follow a logic that might be really bendable, really elastic, like in dreams. You know, in your dreams somehow. You know, people appear in your dreams with a face that doesn't belong to them, but you know that somehow it makes sense. Uh, a, good, a good example of this would be uh, a lot of uh, Studio Ghibli movies, uh, like Spirited Away. I think I'm, I think I'm going to mention Spirited Away uh, soon as well. Mm -hmm. It's a very good example of this, in which, you know, you have a lot of things that not necessarily make sense if you really think about them, but somehow the flow of the story is so nicely put that you don't question it. At some point, you stop questioning these things. You just follow the story. Um, again, let me show something. All right. All right. Uh, so these, these uh, images are a bit to exemplify things that I was saying. You know, in, the, in both Blade Runner movies, like some of the images belong to the newer movie by, by Villeneuve. But the other ones belong to the older movie from the 80s. The movies have a slightly different tone. I would say that the new movie by Villeneuve leans more towards the magical realism 
because there are moments that are really dreamlike in a way. But they both have these very strong visual language in which the world is very firmly grounded and in a way it makes sense, you know, like it provides a lot of visual information about the world, about the society these people lived in, just with the framing, you know, the mm -hmm. kind of architecture, the light, the clothing people are wearing, and so on and so forth. But it still leaves this small element, like, can you see the, the arrow here? Uh, in my uh, screen? Yeah, yeah, the arrow is... Visible. Okay, perfect. So, you know, in this one scene here, for instance, you have seen the movie, there is this very odd, almost fantastic communication between the two characters. And same in this one last scene, when things get progressively to a different tone. And this is what I meant with breaking the rules or bending the rules. Like if, if it's too much of a harsh change, suddenly it feels that your characters, or in this case, your world, which is actually like a background character of your story, they behave out of character. Like they suddenly do things that they, that you have consistently, consistently been telling your audience they shouldn't be doing or they would not do in regular conditions. Mm -hmm. If this happens too harshly, too quickly, or with no setup, then if it's odd, it's like you suddenly are, are contradicting yourself. Whereas if all of uh, whatever number of minutes in your story, you have given hints of that the certain character has enough motivations or enough abilities to change his mind or his or her mind at some point, or that somehow that the rules have the possibility of actually being broken. This is usually like, and um, Dragon Ball is a good example of this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of, it's, it's a very in your face example, but it works really well because you usually have this power limit, but whatever, you know, like Son Goku has whatever power limit and nobody has ever surpassed this limit. But people start mentioning like, oh yeah, but there are legends about this chosen warrior that will be able to do this or like, oh no, only someone who does this and that. And you see that some bit by bit, uh, the main character is working steps towards this, maybe failing all the way, because you have been told several times that achieving this one thing is impossible, that nobody has ever done it. But when this character actually shows you that, oh, he has surpassed this power level, or he has developed this new skill, or whatever, it doesn't completely push you out of the story, because you have seen that the potential for this is already there, that they have been trying, maybe failing, but getting closer and closer every time. Mm -hmm. And under the right circumstances, this has a very powerful dramatic effect in the story of the character. These are images from the Green Knight. And I don't know if you have watched the movie. I have to I, watch it. I absolutely loved it. Really, it's, it's a huge trip. And I will explain why. So the thing is that the proportions of hard and soft in this movie are inverted if you compare it to Blade Runner. So this movie starts in a what seems like a pretty solid, hard, grounded world building. You know, it's, I would say it feels very realistic in a way. Uh, everything makes sense and looks pretty gritty and uh, like characters have like very clear motivations and, and uh, consequences to their actions and so on. But the moment when this one character, the Green Knight, appears on scene, their proportions completely change, and 90% of the movie is increasingly more fantastical, like softer and softer. It's, it's softer in the sense that the rules of the world that you are shown are very abstract. Things happen, you know, like these giants in the mist or like talking foxes or whatever. They just happen. You don't even know why. But at the same time, somehow 
the whole story in itself doesn't push you away. So at some point, you know, when you kind of make sense of things, you just have to switch off your rational brain and enjoy the sensorial experience. And I realized when I was writing this, because I was wondering, why, what, wait a minute, if this happens, how come that you are not pushed away from the story? How come that at some point you are like, okay, this is bullshit, nothing makes sense, I don't understand anything, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pay for this movie. But this doesn't happen. This doesn't happen in a spirited way. This doesn't happen in a Porco Rosso. Doesn't happen in The Green Knight. And I realized that it, it works only, or mostly, because all these stories are focused on the personal journey of one specific character, which the, uh, with which the audience identifies with. So in the case of Spirited Away, we identify with Chihiro, with the little girl, with Porco Rosso, we identify with Porco Rosso, of course. Here we identify with Gawain. And since our scope of the story is so narrow, we only have to follow this one character and their perception of whatever is happening to them. Everything else might be soft because this one thread that we follow is unbroken and is very consistent. But I think it's very difficult to do. But all these examples are really good. So it can lead to it can lead to a story with a lot of poetry in it, with a lot of emotion, that, that does not necessarily provide a very clear message, but it still moves you. Like in, in this one example, in The Great Night, when I got out of the theater, I had already watched some little commentaries about the movie, so I had an idea of the original legend and so on and so forth, but still, it left me questioning things like, what did I just watch? I know that what I watch made sense, I provided a message, but it's not telling that message clearly to your face. It's not over explaining anything. It's providing you with all the elements to formulate the questions and then puzzle up the answers by yourself. So it's, this is what I call treating the audience with respect. And all this, you just basically came in conclusion, like just by like analyzing, everything. like purely you came up with. It. Uh, yeah, I mean, but nice. there are a lot of people who talk about movies. And yeah, yeah, I, I mean, this, this is like, <laughs> yeah, you, I wrongly asked the question, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there are, there are a few things. Of course, like, the thing is that I, I had some ideas when I started developing the presentation, but mm -hmm. as I was writing the presentation and questioning myself, I realized that I had more questions even. Yeah, because now when I like listening to you, I feel like, indeed, you went much deeper than... Uh, now it really feels <laughs> much, much deeper. But it's really nice. I mean... Uh... I actually would like to do, I think I told you probably in Promised Land, that I, this is such a big topic that I actually would like to do a specific topics, a specific talks mm -hmm. or parts of the topic. I guess it will be like never-ending story, honestly. Like the world building basically as a world. It as much. Exactly. Uh, and so moving on, you know, like um, exposition Things that I'm talking about, you know, all these messages are what it's called exposition. You know, like exposition is whatever you use to deliver information. And usually, I love this word like diegetic or extra diegetic. <laughs> I have no idea what uh, it means, but uh, so yeah, it's it's basically diegetic. It would be um, when it it happens within the story. Let's say. Um, a character is listening to the news on the radio and the radio is telling you that there is a zombie invasion outside. You know, so there is no extra text on the screen telling you day one of the zombie invasion. Mm -hmm. It's literally happening in story. Or it, it, a very good example is diegetic music. 
which is like, you know, you have a music, whatever, with a, uh, a long shot of cars in the highway, but then you switch to a shot of the car and you realize that the music is actually the music it's playing inside of the car. That is diegetic music. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. That okay, and extra diegetic, uh, it's the opposite. It's like the typical example of extra diegetic uh, exposition would be the beginning of any Star Wars movie. You know, when you have the scroll of the text, like in a galaxy far, far away, mm -hmm. this and this happened, blah, blah, and explains you everything. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's just a text or maybe a voiceover. Here we go, like, oh, yeah, like in Highlander, like from the dawn of time we come and this and this happens. And like, actually, uh, I wanted to, my original idea was to begin the talk with this clip from Highlander because I think that has always been one of the best examples of extra diegetic exposition because it, it you know it's a black screen with a red text and the voice of Sean Connery recorded in his bathtub uh, giving you just enough information just enough you know it's very very vague but it sets the mood of whatever you're going to watch already like before you see a single image of the story you are already primed for whatever is happening next mm -hmm. but you're not told everything you're just told enough to pick up your interest and to set the mood and i think that is excellent there is actually a question here that kind of fits fits what you are saying now because when you uh, said about the green knight uh, why it like seems normal it pretty much goes from normal to fantastical the question goes but what is your mm -hmm. take to switch the genres from example asking the question from horror to superheroes one movie so for example you set the tone for like let's say horror but then you switch it completely to superheroes and everything like to 180 with the i mean it's good like uh, it's it depends on how you do the transition really um also i don't know the the example that you're giving me from horror to superheroes, mm -hmm. that's like a jump of gender. It's not a jump of tone. Uh, true. Because you, still, you can still have superheroes on horror. <laughs> like, uh, like, like, zombie, like Marvel zombies. I'm like, fucking, oh, that's well, mm -hmm. scary. <laughs> um, that would be amazing to see in a movie. Um, so yeah, again I, again, I think it's just the transition. I, how do you handle the transition, to be honest? And I think... Again, the, the the like the softer approach, like the one in the uh, spirited spirit away and so on. I really think it only works when it's focused on a very simple personal story. Like if you have to diverge and have multiple characters doing different things and different lines you, you need to follow. I think that's when the soft, abstract boundaries of the world start to fall apart. Uh, I think it's very difficult to make it work. But maybe there is an example. If somebody knows any movie, like, like I don't know, Paprika? Uh, is, is, is Satoshi, Satoshi Kon, I think, was the name of the, of the director of Paprika? The, the first thing that kind of came in mind for me was Game of Thrones, kind of, because there were like a lot of different... Things happening, everything was quite normal, but there was this, like, uh, elements that were going more and more fantastical, and they were kind of working together for a really long time, but then fell apart. Exactly, and and this is a, you know this is a very good example. It's very good, but very sad. Satoshi Kon from Paprika. Exactly. So I don't remember Paprika very well, but I think it's also it's extremely abstract extremely hard to follow is is like a trip on lsd mm -hmm. but but i think it's focused on just the one guy and paprika or their relationship and that's it like you don't have to follow much more than that and it's already a lot yeah looking now at the images from the paprika it does look quite crazy <laughs> oh please watch it you don't know it yeah. watch it uh, like, i have uh, seen it like 
maybe 10 years ago or something like this, but I have no memories at all. At, like, at all. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So going back to Game of Thrones, I think that's a very, very good example. Thank you for mentioning it, because really, it's a, a the world of Game of Thrones, even though it's fantastical because there are um, like eyes, zombies, and dragons and stuff, uh, the proportions is basically very hard world building. You know, there are economics and there are social strata in the world. There are politics that work in a very specific way. Every action has a consequence. And at the beginning of the show, at least, there was no such thing as plot armor. You know, like, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, you know, and every character is mostly a gray character, like good guys are not that good, bad guys have motivations not to be especially good, or they think they're good in their own terms. You know, in that sense, even though there were, there was a percentage of like 10% of fantastical things that made the world special, for the most part, it was a very grounded, hard world building example. And in the show, <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the, it fell apart, because there was no transition, you know, there was, of course, very lazy writing, but this lazy writing translating translated in characters behaving out of character, characters be characters not following the rules of the world, which is like, until that point, the rules of the world of Ice and Fire is, if you fuck up, you pay for it, usually, for, usually with your life. And then suddenly characters started to survive against possible odds, and so on and so forth. Then time, distances, everything started to fall apart due to lazy writing. And, and, and it was starting to treat the audience poorly. You know, you start to misbehave with your world, with your story, mm -hmm. and then your audience starts like, and, and then the, the fan service, for instance. There were many things that didn't need to happen and just happened I guess because they wanted to please the audience, like the uh, clay game bowl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be honest, I was really looking forward to the clay game bowl, <laughs> but it was really badly done, man. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Well, let's let's move on. Let's move on. So, finishing with this, I, you have had several minutes to look at this slide, um, but yeah, let me explain. So, I've been explaining what is this position, so you can use basically. A, anything at different degrees to deliver exposition, which is information about the story and the world. Um, but of course, different formats call for different takes on it. What I mean with this is, it's not the same if you have a 15-minute short animation or a teaser trailer that is going to last for three minutes, or if you have eight seasons of a show or a movie of uh, three hours, you know, like, given the format that you're working with, you can afford to deliver information in one way or the other. Like, mm -hmm. if you have less time, you might want to be more direct. Or if you have a lot of time, you can afford to deliver information very gradually, very small amounts, until you need the, the, the audience to know better. Because this is another thing that we were talking about before, you know, and with this cliche of world building as creating a world from scratch with all the creatures and the flora and the social system and so on. There is a strong danger with this, which is it's a very good intention, uh, well-intentioned mistake, but it happens all the time. It's like, you, if you put out a work on building a world or building the background of a story, you want to show it because you probably are super excited about it. You think it's amazing. And the fact that something that is really cool doesn't get to the audience is like, ah, fuck, it's painful. But the problem is that you need to act with measure. That is, deliver only as, as much information as the, as the audience needs to understand the story and to feel the emotions that you want them to feel. What you now say kind of like kind of really much reminds me of how Dark Souls is made because this game basically gives you like the bare minimum questions about the world. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to di like dig deep, then 
you basically have like the entire world to uncover but the entire game just basically tells you like go and lead the fire or something simple as that and then mm. something will happen yeah but it, it still has some consistency right mm -hmm. like the the when you encounter characters the dialogues they have even if they are not addressed to you they might mention uh, the the sun or the fire or the souls like the internal dynamics of the world that even it seems like a very nightmarish kind of like a dark dream sort of ambient like it, it looks like purgatory to me yeah it pretty much is yeah, all right <laughs> also one thing that uh, you also said that i believe if i understand correctly that it's kind of easy to overdone the building uh have you ever wrote the book by brandon sanderson i believe rhythm of war or something like this oh no what what's it about uh basically it's like a fantasy like the entire world is like really high fantasy and everything but the problem with this book is like everything is really epic the dialogues are cool kind of over overdone in some places but the really the biggest problem that i had with this book was the fact that there were no normal things also for example you never had like a normal tree everything had like a different name instead of a tree you would have like a tree or whatever and you don't have like a shell or like a crab but you have like a brab or like every single thing had a different name just for the sake of changing them fantastical at some point when i was like reading it I just couldn't understand what is going on because like I had no idea what this 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 and that is and I had to just read the book and read the explanation mm. on okay so now they are in the forest and so, <laughs> yeah yeah but it's it's very tricky because once you open the door for fantastical things to be there or I mean fantastical or fictional alien things mm. to be there uh where do you stop like if there are minotaurs, would you have bulls? Would you have buffaloes in your world? Uh, does it make sense? Does it not? Like, why? <laughs> you know, um, if you change three animal species, why do you still have normal mm -hmm. ones like eagles and fish? Like, but I think, I think you, you, we, you know, we have to cut ourselves some slack there. Because otherwise, if you want to be consistent with that, you will be writing a fantasy book in a completely different language, in a completely different, like, Elvish or something, okay. if you want to be consistent. Basically what Tolkien did, <laughs> so... Yeah, but that, that guy's amazing, so, mm -hmm. yeah. He's, he's the daddy of all of us in that sense. <laughs> anyway, well, the last bit is the show-don't-tell rule that I, I mean, we all listen to that all the time, we all hear it everywhere, but it's true. Like, it applies to your designs, but it applies also to even the acting of the actors. Like, if they can portray an action or emotion by acting without words, they should do it. Because we are talking about visual media, either if it's comics, video games, movies, that doesn't matter. If you have images, use them. If you are writing a novel, you have words, then stick to them. But, you know, a movie is not a novel, and a video game is not either. So great dialogue is amazing. But if you can use something else that is exclusive to your media, like sound or a, a color or whatever, just use it. Make the best of it. Uh, about the thing that the show don't tell, actually, I think a really cool example was, I believe, in Harry Potter, when the director mm -hmm. told the uh, Baru Snape actor was Alan. Rickman. Alan Rickman. Uh, he, like, uh, Rowling told him the story before it was even written. So he mm. knew how to act, like, why he needed to act way differently or in a really subtle way. So yeah. he would convey, like, a really special emotion. And there, I believe, were even some interviews uh, when the actors were not understanding why the Rickman is playing this way, this <laughs> certain thing. Because he was the only, like, person who knew how he needs to play. So yeah. I think this is a lot. 
but it's at the top. Yeah, it's, really yeah, it's, awesome. it's amazing. It's amazing. And, and that actor just was perfect for the role. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I forgot a bit what I was, what I was saying, um, what I was going to say with these images, but, um, so yeah, um, the thing is that we talk a lot about very obvious examples of world building, like science fiction and fantasy, because there you actually, you know, the, the world you are showing to the audience, um, moves so far away from the world that we know that you really need to build things and you need to explain things because otherwise people will be like, what, what, why are these horses flying? You know, but, but actually world building can be anything. Like the moment that you start telling a story, like once upon a time in a land far, far away, you are already creating a world. It's a bubble. You know, within this bubble, different rules apply. Are you as a storyteller are the one uh, that is setting up the rules? And it's also very fragile, you know, it's a bubble. So the moment that you break the rules, it pops. And the illusion of this belief is broken. But so what I mean is that uh, these images are from Children of Man. And the world that we see in Children of Man, it doesn't really change much from the world that we know. You know, it's same cars, same cops, same buildings, same weather, same weapons, everything is the same. There is only one factor that changes, which is the main uh, driver of the story, which is nobody has children anymore. Like women are not fertile anymore. And this affects everything else. It's like, it's just a single question. What if, you know, what if this happened? And just with this variant, following a more or less logical approach of what again like hardware building like things make sense things have consequences things are interconnected you get to the story and of course the story has a tiny bit of whimsical effect like a whimsical factor but it's very minimal like everything is well within what would make sense in a way there is nothing too fantastical about it and when it is, you know, when the in, when the rules are broken in this one story is for maximum dramatic effect. And it's beautiful to be to behold. It's one of the best scenes that I've seen when the rules of the story are broken. Wow. Amazing. But it's also hard to do. It is. It is. But when it's done, it has the maximum effect. Um, Oh yeah. So yeah, I talk about this already. Like the consistency is the basic thing, you know, like is when I say, when I, when I talk about setting clear rules and not breaking the rules is basically if you say that your world and your people, your characters behave in a specific way, stick with it, uh, make the, make the best out of it, like squeeze all the flavor of it. But sometimes, only sometimes you can break the rules. And if you do it properly with this, which with a good setup, then they become the best tool you can have for a good story. Because um, if you stick, like if you don't, uh, well, how do you express this? Like if you don't break any rules. If if uh, there is nothing even remotely outlandish in the story, no matter what it is. It might be just a character behaving suddenly, you know, completing their character arc and suddenly behaving in a different way. If you don't ha even have this in your story, it becomes very lineal. It doesn't need to be bad, but it's also not very engaging. It doesn't have a climax to it. Um, but if, if you do, let's say, you know, like, could be something as simple as your main antagonist, your main villain, finally completing his or her character arc and suddenly changing his mind in a moment of redemption. And this is an amazing emotional climax of the story. It might also be that suddenly Son Goku turns blonde with blue eyes and everyone is like, what? <laughs> that traumatized a generation, my generation. Um, but yeah, like you can do it. If you do it right, it's amazing. If you don't do it right, it becomes this. This is the only movie ever that I stepped in. Yes. 
at some point I was just like, okay, enough. I'm just going. I'm not watching. Yeah. So here I list a few of the most common examples that I can think of of the weak. Uh, it's. I know that for most of the people who are listening to this, probably it seems that I I interchange a lot war building and writing or script writing. But the thing is that with war building, we use everything. You know, you use the visual development of the story to deliver visual exposition. You use the storyboarding, you use uh, the sound design, and of course you use the script writing. Like all of it works together. That's why war building is such a, it's kind of difficult to define because sound design is very clearly set. Like it begins and ends when it comes to the sound. Um, camera angles, storyboarding, concept art, all of these are very specific, very specific fields with very specific tasks. But world building takes all of them together, like orchestra. And yeah, like it kind of focuses too much on one or the other. They all need to work together. Anyway, so yeah, you know, common mistakes is that the rules of your world are very flimsy. You know, not necessarily just good, dreamlike, whimsical stuff, but simply like not really clearly set. Like distances don't make sense. Um, technology behaves in very convenient ways sometimes. This is when the consistency, when it's broken, um, let's say with no proper setup, this could happen in two ways. Like the Deus Ex Machina is the typical convenient, I think it's called a MacGuffin or a, you know, plot armor, for instance. Suddenly a character that by all rights and logic should at least lose a fight or die or get injured is not. Suddenly, it survives or triumphs or whatever. Why? Like it's clearly it's clearly out of his death. Why is it surviving? You know, or like there is no setup. If you tell me this character has been moving on to a particular direction, it makes sense that under specific circumstances, it can break its own limits. And suddenly, you know, maybe it's much stronger than he thought. Or uh, uh, like the hound, you know, the hound defeating his fear of fire because he has the right emotional motivation to do it. And you have seen that he's been moving in increments towards this point over the story. This is a good setup. But if suddenly you tell me that this guy has been traumatized by fire all his life and then casually steps into a room that is on fire to grab a chicken. It's like, no, <laughs> what is this? And then the other thing is like the information dump that is that's very, very common, especially in Hollywood movies. And I hate it. You know, providing uh, like hold the whole system of time travel works. Mm. Like, you don't need to know it. You don't, if it's a good story, you don't need to know this. Because you are too invested emotionally in the story to wonder about like, hey, well, yeah, but what, how does the portal work? But if it's... Then you need the paper with like and to explain how a wormhole works. Exactly. How the hyperspace drive is working and so on. You don't need this information. It's too technical. Uh, you need an emotional connection to the story. And this information dump or whatever that speaks to me of not treating either your own story or your audience with respect. Because sometimes either you're showing information for the sake of showing it just because you thought it was cool and you work so hard on it and you want to show it. It doesn't really add anything to the story or anything positive, doesn't move the plot forward, but you want to show it anyway. Or the other thing, which is, <laughs> and sadly that's very, very Hollywood-like, like you don't expect your audience to understand so you tell them everything. And that's really boring. I, I feel personally insulted with this happens in a movie. And usually they do it in a way where even the explanation pretty much just don't make sense, especially in everything that is like science fiction. Like mm -hmm. every single time it's like quantum something, 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 and they just drop a bunch of like scientific terms and everything. And then people are mm -hmm. like, okay, we just checked it. It don't make any sense. Can explain. It's just yeah. explaining it worse way. 
I mean, the thing is that they rely a lot. I think Star Wars in general, like all the movies, especially that the, the uh, newer ones are terrible, but even the older ones, which I really like, they they have some inconsistencies there, and it's funny to see how the the fan community actually tries to fill the gaps. It's like, no, um, you know, we all know that the original fight between old Obi Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader is not very flashy because it was a different time, and the actor who was playing Obi Wan was very old, and the guy who was wearing the costume of uh, Darth Vader was a very big guy who was kind of clumsy. And they were not even trained to do stage fight. So they did this kind of very simple, very minimalistic fight, which is okay. Uh, which is, has nothing to be with what we see young Obi-Wan doing or young Anakin doing. And the fans were like, no, you know, like this, this happens because in that moment Obi-Wan was connecting with the Force and he was not there. And, you know, they're... Why do you leave the audience to do all your work as a writer? This is not fair. You know, it's good, it's, it's good to leave the audience feel some gaps. That's good, but that's too much. Yeah, it's basically like fixing the plot hole. Yeah, and just relying on the goodwill of an audience that loves a universe, and that's kind of unfair. I feel better it is if you leave the fans to make speculations instead of search for solutions. So mm -hmm. this way, like, the audience can feel engaged and actually, like, think about it instead of, like, just solving it. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So this is the opposite. I guess you watch Avatar The Last Airbender? No, absolutely <laughs> never. Not a single episode. I know. I know, but this is, like, one of the shows that I just, like, never saw ever. Go to your room <laughs> I and think of what you're done. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know I wanted to, but always when I wanted to start, it was like, nah, not to me. And it was like going on. <laughs> but I know it from memes, so I have a basic understanding of the plot. Mm. And I know the huh? old guy. So. Uh, it's really good. Really, really good. Mm -hmm. And I, I love it especially because... It's a show, like, it's not childish, but it's intended for children. And children shows tend to very easily disrespect the audience. Because they sometimes are, you know, they just think that children are dumb and children are not. They're very smart. And they, they are more in need of good stories than we are. Anyway, the thing is that I really love that this show not only takes itself seriously, but takes the audience seriously, and it evolves over time. So it's a bit like people say this about the Harry Potter books as well, that the story gets more mature as the audience also grows up with the books. You know, it was foolish one year, then second year, another one, and so on. With the show, it's the same. Like every book so every season um kind of adds the stakes and the complexity a bit because the audience also is growing up too mm. and and it does in a it does it in a very subtle way so over the course of the three books of the first show because there is a second one which is also very good uh it starts introducing more and more complex and nuanced topics and themes and reactions from the characters and it starts building the personality of each one of them bit by bit <laughs> it's just delicious it's just so so well done like in this fantastic world with magical powers and flying bisons and people who play with fire and so on you know it could be the most over the top thing ever and still has very clear rules that are almost never broken and if they're broken they are always for maximum emotional effect with a very proper setup so it never pushes you away all the on the other hand like it brings you in it makes you want more of that world because it's not overly explained it's shown does it make sense like you only gather information about this very very interesting world by witnessing it 
not by reading or somebody telling you that things are this way and the other. So you need to be there. And yeah, I don't know. And I, themes I, are very emotional. Yeah, and, and the thing is like, I, I don't want to spoil anything, but of course at some point of the story, uh, some major rules of the world are broken, but are broken with a very good setup in a very climactic moment. And when you do things this way, instead of breaking the suspension of this of this belief, what they do is, well, as I said, like they have a very strong dramatic effect, and they redefine the world. You know, it's uh, yeah, I don't want to spoil anything. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's very, it's no funny. problems. But uh, it it would be a bit like in Matrix. When Neo, so it's in, ne in, in Matrix, in the first movie at least, is explicitly explained that we don't fuck with the agents. Nobody has ever defeated an agent. And it's very well shown, you know, like first time that, more, that Neo fights one, he gets screwed. Morpheus, that up to that point has been the most baddest rebel member, he barely stands, he barely holds his ground, and in the end he's defeated. So why, when finally Neo kind of somehow unlocks his powers or something, mm -hmm. it's a very strong and very good what the fuck moment. And mm -hmm. it redefines the rules of the world. And it's amazing. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, really it's like, basically wow. the same as in Dragon Ball. So like you never, like Goku never loses, then he loses, and then he just does the blonde hair and now he is not losing <laughs> then he does like blue hair red hair blue <laughs> color and it is yeah yeah that's the problem mm -hmm. if you do it if you do it too often it loses it it's, it's impact you know it gets mm -hmm. blunt and that's a shame but when you do it only once for the climax of the story then it's like whoa wow uh i, I mean i i am the i remember when i went to school the next day, after me and my friends, each one if in our own place, watch that moment, and Goku turned Super Saiyan for the first time. Mm -hmm. And we were all fucking shocked. We were like, just looking at each other like, hey, hey, did you, did you see it? Yeah, yeah, my god, yeah. And we didn't even need to talk about it. We were like, what the fuck? What, what did just happen? But of course, that was the first time. Afterwards, it's like, oh, there it goes again. All right. mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but after the first time, you just go into the computer and you search for like Goku SSJ 10, SSJ 12, and you only find the images like more her, more her, more her. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That it's a shame. Like, I'm really glad that I lived that moment mm -hmm. when I when it was fresh and new. My God. <laughs> yeah, when when this happened, I was like extremely young. I believe I was entering like second grade or third grade. So I, I do remember it, but really vaguely. Mm. Anyway, let's move on a bit. So I, I guess you watched the last Dune movie. I did. <laughs> Have really. you watched the older one? The older one may be in parts than ages ago. I wanted to actually watch it like recently, uh -huh. but couldn't find it. And so I will just need to. But I heard, heard it's... It's really cool, but it's... Uh... I mean, it's super interesting to see how different people take on the same story. And I, so I, I love the David Lynch movie. It's the one that I grew up with. Um, but it's funny because the, the take of David Lynch, I mean, if you know David Lynch, you know how mm -hmm. he makes movies, how he writes stories. And they tend to be very soft, like very abstract in many ways. You're very dreamlike. And Dune is no exception. Like it's uh, characters in the David Lynch movie, they even speak like they are in some sort of Shakespeare play. They, it's more more lyrical the way they speak. Uh, man, there is a lot of voiceover. There is a lot of um, sort of dreamlike sequence in which the characters kind of maybe hallucinate or have. It's it's very abstract. Also, because I guess the the VFX were not as as easy to do back then. 
but I appreciate the effort a lot. It's mm -hmm. it's very good. And this take by Villeneuve, even those for the most part takes almost shot by shot, many moments of many frames of the David Lynch movie. The take is completely different. It's very very much hard war building. It's very much grounded in a in the political and social system of the universe that uh, the writer created and and of course there is a bit of this mystical element because that's the essence of dune but uh it, it's a much more smaller percentage in this movie let's see about the the second movie when it comes out but the first one was really toned down but let's go for it mm. anyway in in the first movie of dune we are introduced to a very very complex world and Actually, I've been talking to a few people and some of them complain about the same thing, which is they, they were not familiar with the story at all. They haven't read the books. They haven't watched the original movie. So they felt that they were thrown into a very complex world and they had to digest a lot of information in very little time. I didn't have that feeling because I already know the world and I really know the story. So it's difficult to put myself on their shoes. But I thought that they condense a lot of information in the movie very well through visual design. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, I, wait, I will interrupt you for a second because when I was watching this movie with a friend of mine and like my significant other and two other friends never like like they heard about Dune but they never like read it or they did not know the story. They told me afterwards that it it was like a lot of things, but it was thrown in a really clear and not overwhelming way. And they were like genuinely interested to like learn more, to like dig deeper into this. But but yeah, but it, it was thrown in a in a good way. Yeah, I think so too. Very effective. Also because you know it's the very focus on out of this huge universe is just focused on three factions. You have the protagonists, the Atreides, you have the antagonists, the Harkonnen, and you have this wild card of the Fremen that you need. I, I really like the visual design. I, I'm, like, I'm not really a, fre uh, a very big fan of um, sort of like homogenic examples. Like in, in you look at the Harkonnen, of course, they all look Harkonnen, but they also all look the same. And kind of the same with the Atreides and so on. And, okay, you know, you're just going to be following the main recognizable characters, like the Beast, uh, Raban, and the Duke. And so, so you're going to focus on these specific individuals. The background guys are just there to kind of support the image and the vibe. But I understand that if you have only so many minutes in a movie to display one faction and deliver a message, you need to be very specific. You cannot really um, flesh out members of a culture as complex individuals because it's not, then again, it's not the format that you need. If you have a, if instead of a movie, I think this one was like two and a half hours, something like this. Even closing to. Uh huh. So it, instead of a three hour long movie, which is okay, it's pretty long, but you have a lot of story to tell. If you have a TV show of seven seasons, you can still take this guy here and show us that he's a complex individual with his own motivations and uh, he doesn't always dress this way and so on and so forth. But if you only have, let's say, three hours of a movie, maybe 25 minutes to show the Harkonnen, <laughs> this is what you get, you know? Mm. And it's very effective. Like, if you look at only at this frame of the Harkonnen, what do you think of? They are the bad guys. Yeah, but why? Uh, menacing look, black clothes, everything. Just, just looks angry. And... Like, the weapons are outside. They are just... They just look... <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it, it, of course you're right, but I'm interested in the why. And the why is like first, um, I'm going to talk about this 
uh, in more depth later, but first they are extremely white. Uh, they are the whitest guys. Um, at least in the novel, I think this is more clear than in the that in the movies. But in the novels, most people in the universe are brown, mm -hmm. different degrees of brown. You know, it's a good point. You know, so far in the future that we have mixed and intermingled so much as a species mm -hmm. that there is no really like pure white people anymore. It's like just like different degrees mm -hmm. of black. So it's also like a very racial story that we're talking about. Second, they are skinheads. Basically, they, they are hooligans, you know, like mm -hmm. the lack of hair sends this message of uh, aggressiveness. You know, it's like hooligans, Nazis, neo-Nazis, whatever. Uh, but also, hair is something that uh, provides a lot of humanity and personality to someone. You know, it's it, even, even when you are still, your hair gives you some is still alive, it's still moving, has some expression. When you remove this and they even they even don't have eyebrows, you take away a lot of their humanity as well. Mm, yeah, especially that. <laughs> it's really also nowadays you really rarely see someone who is like bald and they don't have any mustache or facial hair whatsoever. <laughs> like extremely rare. Yeah, but but the combo of being shaved and having like a goatee or something is like a bit always a bit creepy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, and and well, going back to the designs and the costume as well, it looks a lot like Riot Police. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know that's always going to be intimidating. That's always going to speak a bit about about the bad guys in a way. And now moving on to the good guys, you know the Atreides. Um. I really like how knight-like their armor looks. I just wanted to say they basically look like the, the nice knights, polished hair and everything. They they just look. Good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even even the the swords they look like katanas. Mm -hmm. So they look, you know, nobility, samurais, knights. Uh, like I, I I think I have some slides later specifically about them. Because yeah, they, they really, they really, I think they really landed a lot of very positive sounding cliches in one faction in so many ways. And then you have the Fremen, which, you know, like Bedouins, they're basically Bedouin tribes. Mm. And I really, like, I really like how Javier Bardem, I don't know if he was told to do this, but he doesn't even try to hide his Spanish accent when he speaks English in this movie. Mm -hmm. He's like, no, fuck it. I'm just going to be myself. Boom. <laughs> it works. <laughs> it works really well, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and in this world that is so solid, you have this one element that is completely alien because until this point, you know, we always see like, yeah, spaceships, but they still look technological. It looks like something that could work. We see machines, we see, we see cities, and we see planets, like stuff that we know that seems feasible. And then we have this. Like, I actually prefer this design from the David Lynch movie. This one, yeah, this, this one is funny because it looks like an eye. Mm -hmm. I think it's very symbolic as well. I think it's pretty cool. But this one, this one creature that is basically the one really alien thing that we see in the movie is also the one thing that defines the story is the one radical element of it. So it's very well used. You know, it's, just, it's not just like randomly throwing around funny looking alien creatures for no reason. Like this one thing is there and it plays a major role. Mm -hmm. Like the whole world of Dune and the spies is based on these creatures. They are essential to the story. Without this, you don't have a story. Mm -hmm. No, basically, so I think, there is no Dune with it. Exactly. I think it's fantastic. Um, then, of course, you have all the technological design that, speaking about hardware building, you know, of course, we don't have these ornithopters, but they look so much like things that we already know. Like, this looks like a helicopter, like a Apache helicopter or something. This looks like, um, uh, how do you call it? Uh, how do you call the ships that carry ships? Leaf. Mm. Let me check it. 
Cruiser, Battle Cruiser, might be Cruiser. Uh, yeah, whatever. But yeah, you know, what I mean is that it looks like something that we know already. <laughs> it's not, but it looks familiar enough. So we don't need to make an extra effort while we are watching the movie to place ourselves in that world. It's sort of like, it's sort of welcoming because it feels familiar enough. It just steps, it's a few steps away to like, wow, this is very cool, but I don't feel out of place. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. And Even the, the costumes, you know, like the costumes look like something that maybe you could do with your hands and you probably will wear if you lived in that place. But we just went a different direction and had not this type of a cool, different cool. Yeah, yeah, sadly. <laughs> yeah, and, um, oh, yeah, uh, you were saying? Yeah, also, could you go to the previous one? Huh? With the ships? Yeah, uh, also the bottom one when I was watching the movie kind of struck me that it's really similar to the uh, this cruiser ship, whatever, from Star Wars mm -hmm. in a shape. So it was basically <laughs> yeah, yeah. like. Kind of like saying, like, okay, you know what it does, and it was basically almost doing the same thing. It was just transporting mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, okay. Yeah, people were talking about, oh, yeah, they took it from the Jawas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and this is like more, a bit more in depth with the fashion, with the faction design. Mm -hmm. I really like the fact that the vibe they chose for the Harkonnen was like insectoid and like bio, like cyber organic. Like the cyber organic thing, you don't really get to see it very well in these shots. It's more like in the vehicles and stuff, but in the architecture design is is very nicely shown and in some details. Um, but here you really get to see how it looks like a moth. Mm -hmm. And even like if, if you um if you squint your eyes a bit, this also look like um how do you call it? Like a bit like a, there are some larva that look uh, like I it. I know which one. Hmm. Uh, yeah, like I a... have no clue how it's called, but but I know what you mean. Yeah, but they do have this vibe, and it's nice because it's it's a vibe. It's enough. Like you don't know, you cannot really. It's not in your face. They're not telling you like, yeah, you know, they're basically insects. Like it's all segmented. Like, it's just enough to make you think of. Uh, very disgusting things like cockroaches, moths, worms, stuff like that. Have you seen the designs done by HR Giger for the Dune? Yeah. So yeah, 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 yeah. I was thinking like that those just basically looks like really dissolved tiger, tiger people. Or Giger. Yes, they are. They absolutely are. And um, I like. I didn't mention this at the beginning because they're kind of like a different faction, none of the main ones. But I really love the Sardaukar. I always loved uh, even even the original David Lynch movie in which the costume design is is very I don't know maybe low budget is but it's very freaky. It's it's really it's not especially pretty, but uh, it's it's really unsettling. Mm. Yeah, it's it's nightmarish. But what I like about them in this particular movie, and I think they did it really well is that you have this obviously very highly technological costume and armor and everything, but you have these very ritualistic and primitive elements of the smears of blood here. You know, this mm -hmm. it condenses so well how fanatic or ritualistic, how like primitive uh, this faction is. And it it's a contrast that originally belonged basically to Dune. Like, all science fiction settings didn't have this much of a contrast between hardcore science fiction technological stuff, we are in the space colonizing worlds, and the complete primitive ritualistic, almost magical thinking um, way of things. Like, Warhammer 40k, which I absolutely love, it's an absolute ripoff of Dune in many ways, and the Sardaukar are the Space Marines, like 100%. Um, but yeah, and it takes Warhammer takes all this vibe of a contrast between highly advanced technological stuff and completely retrograde um, 
ritual and religion and fanaticism to to the ninth power whatever. And yeah, we have these guys. And actually, when I was when I was uh, gathering references for the talk, I realized one thing about the Atreides, and I think it actually it already explains the ending of the story. <laughs> Like, I don't want to do many spoilers here, but, well, the thing is that we already established that apparently, the same as the Starks, actually the colors are very similar to the Starks, in a way, they're the good guys, right? They are noble. They they hammer this down a lot, like, because the the name of the planet is Caladan, which stands for Caledonia, like one of the old names of Scotland. They even play bagpipes when they come out of the ships in Dune, mm-hmm. in Arrakis. So you have this Highlander sort of vibe. They do have this samurai and knight impression to them, this nobility, even their hairstyles, weird. They look like all colonial. This guy in this frame looks like uh, the King Leopold II of Belgium uh, in the colonial times. Like, it wouldn't be out of place. And that's already telling you something. You know, that's already, already, uh, sorry, already giving you hints of a specific period in time that we know and we can relate to. And this guy here, this is the one that shocked me the most. Because this uniform looks a lot like the British uniforms of World War One Or World War II, too. Um, and what happens in World War One? And this is a complete... I just came up with this when I was with the talk, and I don't think, I, maybe I'm not right, but from what I know of the story, it makes total sense. Because then you have the Fremen, which are clearly inspired in Bedouin tribes. All this architecture already looks like Morocco and Egypt. It's like taken to 11. So what we see here with all these factions is, of course, a story about colonialism. Colonialism based on a specific resource, which is the spice. And to me, it really smells like what happened in in, uh, the Middle East in World War I, when the British basically were negotiating with the Arab tribes against the Turks. Uh, and the Axis, like the uh, Turks, I think, were allied with Germany at the time, and I don't remember very well. Um, so they were negotiating and promising them independence and freedom in exchange for oil, which in this case is the spice. And we all know what happened there. <laughs> Didn't end up very well. So I'm not gonna give I'm not gonna give more hints about the story of Dune, but Given all these pieces of information that we are all just gathering through mostly visual hints, we can already start guessing what's going to happen by the end of the story. I mean, most likely you are right because also it was written like in a times when the entire like World War thing was like still a hot topic. Stories were as much more well known. So I guess it's natural like everyone mm-hmm. i once even heard that some writers were saying that if you are writing a science fiction or fantasy book basically impossible to write something new it, this is also what george R. martin said about the song of ice and fire that he mm-hmm. basically took like real events in the world and just renamed them and just yeah like work so most likely Um, true. Nice cut. I mean, you know what we usually talk when when we are gathering references for a design, you know, and and it's always the same. Like if you, let's say, uh, yeah, uh, Evan Amundsen. I guess you know mm-hmm. him. So he he actually spoke about world building too in the same Promised Land festival, mm-hmm. like actually the day before I did the yeah. talk. <laughs> and, and he made a very good point about the Lord of the Rings uh, versus The Hobbit. I'm talking about the movies. Mm. And why, why we are so fond of the Lord of the Rings movies and we prefer to forget about 
the Hobbit movies. And there are many reasons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my God, that breaks my heart. Um, but one of them is because visually speaking, the Lord of the Rings movies, all the designs and everything are based on things that we already know, are existing things in the real world, in real history. So even though they're fantastical and they're adapted to the context and the setting, we are familiar enough with them um, to recognize them properly. Mm -hmm. But with The Hobbit, they're already like based on things that are based on things that are based on loosely mm -hmm. realistic stuff. So the distance is much higher. And the distance is much longer, and it, 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 it is not as solidly grounded. Uh, it, it's, it, I don't know, like, uh, it's not as easy to believe all the things that we see on the screen and all the designs we see, because they seem too far away from what we know. For me, what was, like, the biggest downside in Hobbit was the dwarves. Out of the rings, when you had Gimli, he basically looked like a proper dwarf. <laughs> but in a Hobbit, they all looked like normal people, and when there was a battle, they all looked like dwarves from Warhammer. Like basically, yeah, type of Warhammer dwarf, and you just copy the mm. design and slightly adjust. Yeah, the, the they look like caricatures. Nice. Yeah, the Hobbit is nice to watch, but like to turn off your brain and just maybe. But uh, for me, this is the the only thing that I I liked in Hobbit. I could just like enjoy some visuals, not all, but mm. story wise and design wise, some places were. Um, uh, that it, that was breaking my heart all the way because some of the some of the keyframes in the Hobbit are so amazing and so good, and mm. like especially the ones related to the King of the Elves. That character is really nice. It has so much visual mm. power, but it gets lost. In, in the story, in a story that is very weak. And it, it's painful because you, you can see that people who work in the movie, they really knew what they were doing and they were putting a lot of effort in it. And it's, it's very sad when you see that all this effort is, is, doesn't deserve all the praise it, need, it, it, it should deserve because it's not in the service of a good, solid, re, solidly written story. It's, mm -hmm. really, it's really sad. But anyway, yeah, in here the the base was, and also for the really cool shots that you mentioned, the thing that was also not working for me was this CGI bloom effect on like every shot that you could see. Like if something is powerful, like like everything is shiny, and nice, and the bloom is every, and you have yeah. like ten different eye sources. Yeah, for, mm. for me it was a, a little. Yeah, and everything looked to. To stage, like the light, the mm. color, uh, and it's it's you know it's good if again I've seen movies in which you are literally in a dream world, or maybe um, uh, what's there was this movie with Robin Williams in which he actually goes to heaven or to hell or purgatory mm. to look for his wife, and of course all the colors are overblown and the light is different and stuff because you are in a different world and that's fine it's used for a for a narrative purpose but in the hobbit is just similarly used or no is like adding a lot of cheese to something mm. trying to salvage something that it's actually not tasting good but you just keep adding cheese in the hope that it will good be nice <laughs> yeah i get <laughs> yeah, and also the last thing about the Hobbit, like the, the dumbest decision that they made was with the Dwarf King, because they had a real actor who was playing the Dwarf, but they mm. made just a really bad decision to replace him completely with CGI model, and put so much that it was like a CG model, that was not even mm. like, maybe not, it was not badly animated, but it was lacking mm. a lot of capital F. It really looked off. Opinion. But yeah. I mean, that, that leads to a different thing that uh, also makes me feel weird, which is their overemphasis on CGI in modern cinema. It's like, yeah, it's really cool that we have that tool. But I think that a lot of people 
I don't know if it's like old school people that grew up in the 80s and 90s with practical effects or just everyone, but I think we're missing a lot of this. The feeling of imperfection that comes from practical effects. Mm-hmm. I guess the... Like in the... I continue. Sorry, no, no, no. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I guess the best show they combined practical with CGI was the Mandalorian because they really used a lot of practical stuff and they used the mm. uh, CG screens like the the screens behind everything to lead everything early in a really cool manner. I don't know if you have seen the the documentary about it. Uh no, I've seen the show, but I haven't seen the documentary. Uh, you should see the breakdown on how they made it because long story short basically they had a scene build up and around them they had like these huge screens that were displaying the uh, the backgrounds and they were leading the entire set and they were like tracking where the actors and where the camera is so to adjust the perspective of everything mm. uh, I believe this yeah yeah you will find it interesting. later I will. yeah super nice mm-hmm. for the questions so I have first question so have you do you have your own IP that you are developing like right now <laughs> Uh, actually, yes, um, and I hope, <laughs> I really hope that I can find time <laughs> just to <laughs> work on some more designs, because at the moment I only have a few very, very old designs, and a few other concepts that I managed to do more or less recently that look okay, but that's not enough to, to and, and also I need to do a lot more writing, like I have a lot of writing down on this but i still need to condensate it in a few specific concepts and with this i can start working properly but yeah i do have one or two okay so i guess i will like develop on those because things that were always bothering me i think so do you feel that you need to be like everyone on your right so you need to do a writing you need to do like the concepts the story like basically everything or you think mm. it will be a better approach? Basically, like maybe not hire someone, but to cooperate with someone who, for example, is much better at writing than you. You will just mm. give them like, a catch of a writing and they will just do a nice. Or do you feel mm. like this emotion attached to it? Everything. Mm. Okay. Um, the first impulse, of course, was I want to do everything. I want to do absolutely everything myself, but uh, as I was writing and different or trying to solve some of these IPs, especially with one of them, I kept getting to this dead end again and again and again. And I was talking to people, trying to find a way to justify this one idea or this one thing, and I couldn't. So at some point I was like, I don't need to do this. Yeah, I'm a visual artist. I can do all the visual stuff and hope that some good writer will be interested and we can work together on this. Mm-hmm. But I it was like an exercise of it was both a, a it was both a revelation and an exercise of ego, like controlling my ego, like I don't need to do this. I'm good at what I am and I don't have the tools to solve this problem. So I better find I better find someone who does. Yeah, at some point you will get to the point where you want to compose an entire like before your. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. And for the IPs, do you think? I I guess it depends on the on the IP, but do you think it's better to work from a really general? like spectrum and then make it denser and denser to the specifics or maybe start with like a really small story and build mm-hmm. on this and then make another small sto- small story and maybe connect them somehow mm. I think it just boils down to personal preference because all the approaches actually work uh, whatever keeps you engaged the most because I think the biggest problem is to keep your own interest for long enough because I think a lot of us just get very excited about a project and then th- like life comes in the way and then yeah. time keeps going on and at, the, at some point the story doesn't seem that interesting anymore or worth the effort and yeah whatever and it gets forgotten 
So, yeah. Okay, there is a question on opinion on personal world building only for illustration purposes. Um, well, I don't know exactly what this person means, but as a teacher, for instance, I get really annoyed when somebody shows me their sketches or, you know, character designs or something with a minimum of work. And then they start like, no, because, you know, he's wearing the sword there because his father gave him this and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, don't tell me your life. I <laughs> Your, your designs should be talking by itself. And of course, like it's nice if you know all this and if you give me a minimum of information so I can understand some things. Uh, but if you need to speak to, you need to talk too much, something's not working with your design or your illustration. Uh, but don't you think that sometimes you need text to explain something that is visual because I often heard that the design must like speak for itself, it must explain the story and everything, but sometimes I do think it's just possible to explain the entire story only visually. Um, well, and then it depends. Um, you want... So, when, when you show, uh, when you show a, an illustration or a piece of artwork to someone, do you want them to read them in the specific way that you intended or you want to you want them to have their own reading i mean if you do something and show it to someone it basically starts living its own life uh -huh. like impossible to force them to read it a certain way but i guess you can give them a background on for example if you are especially designers or concept art or whatever what were your mm. goals and how you solved them so for example you Gave, give them a painting and something just looks really odd let's like, say visually it's just it's just odd it, it feels out of place but if you read the background for it like this was the feeling that you wanted to convey and you made it successfully mm -hmm. but you needed an explanation why it looked mm -hmm. this was like your brain so mm -hmm. yeah but but it, for instance, in that one example that you're giving me it already worked visually because it already trapped you there. It's like <laughs> this thing, like I like this or I disliked it, but I don't know why. Why? Why is this there? And this why is that? Why? Why? You, you know, it's, it's not a question that you can easily answer, um, but it's already to trap the audience for a bit, and yeah, get more invested because that's what you want. <laughs> and. Uh... Do I have any more questions? Because the presentation, as someone said in the comments, was really good at discussing and breaking down storytelling and design topics. Thank you for that. I guess people, people only to don't have much questions. Uh, yeah, I don't think I do have any more. Unless something comes to your mind that you over or... Mm, I don't know. We talk about so many things. <laughs> yeah. Because there was... Um, uh -huh. Okay, continue. Yeah, basically, like I, I like to remember, like when when I was studying uh, in my hometown many many years ago, uh, one teacher told me something that I, I didn't really understand at the time, which was like, you should never you should never ever completely finish a work. You should always leave something unfinished, mm -hmm. because that's the door where your audience can get into. You know, like if you let's say the example of it would be if you give an illustration that is absolutely perfectly neat and clear and whatever it's probably going to be visually very nice and people might just like like it because it looks pretty um but if everything is visually explained and shown and whatever and described there's nothing else to it so when you leave something, yes, maybe something vague enough to get people to just question, like, you know, to, to fill in the gaps, to make their own story out of it. This is what I was mentioning before about Blade Runner. You know, like, people still watch and talk about Blade Runner after 30 years or more because it leaves this window open. You know, it shows you a lot of the world, it's very defined and it's very but it's also leaving enough open space for every single member of the audience to watch it, 
and come out with their own part of the story. Mm-hmm. In, and in this sense, the story becomes theirs. Yeah, and that's why they are invested in that. You know, like it, it's a part of them. They can associate like their their in. And also for the first thing that you said, nation, uh, I heard something remotely similar that you should never finish your artwork. That an artist actually is it's impossible for an artist to finish an artwork. You can only abandon it at some point. And mm. after abandoning it, I said previously, just starts living its life. And it's up mm. to you, like, what people do with it. Like, it's up to people what, and not not to. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's only a bit painful when, you know, like it hasn't happened to me yet, but probably will. When a collective of people, when people use your art as, or whatever work you are publishing as as the image of ideas that you don't agree with. Like, let's say it hasn't happened to me, but maybe, I don't know, some neo-Nazi group actually takes some of my Warhammer works and they're like, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, like, and I will be like, no. <laughs> you know, or, or, I don't know, for instance. Uh, and you cannot help it. You know, it's out there and people are going to connect with it one way or another. And you don't have any control of the w- about the way they're going to connect with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, this is yeah. also the thing that you can see with everything <laughs> convey like a certain information but yeah this yeah i guess i don't have any more questions, so thanks again for being here and for like amazing presentation it, it was really nice of you and really cool thing uh so yeah i guess i guess we will finish here and if anyone has any more questions feel free to ask them in the comments if there will be any i will forward them forward the questions later to you so yeah thanks again and i hope everyone learned learned something cool and yeah thank you so much <laughs> see ya <laughs> Hello.